Hello again, everyone, and welcome to today's program entitled Work and Worship, Religion in the Workplace. My name is Mary Teresa Metzler, and I am a partner in the Labor and Employment Group at Ballard Spar. I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, Shannon Farmer, who is also a partner in the Labor and Employment Group, and Jean Hemphill, who is a partner in the Business and Finance Group, as well as the practice leader of Ballard Spar's Health Care Group. The questions during and after the program, but we are limited as far as timing. Feel free to submit questions via the question and answer box you see on your screen or email them to us directly after the program. If time allows, we will answer your questions during the webinar or at the end of the webinar. If not, we will follow up with you after the program. So circulated slides for the webinar in advance. The slides along with the recording of the webinar will be sent to you as a follow-up. This topic of religion in the workplace is certainly one of the hot topics in employment law. Our workplaces are more diverse in a variety of ways, including the religious beliefs and preferences of our employees. As employers and human resources professionals, it is your responsibility to be familiar with and navigate the various laws which might impact your hiring, treatment, and discipline employees with varying religious beliefs, traditions, and religious requirements. With in mind, let's look at the subjects we'll be covering in today's webinar. Talking about the applicable laws and definitions of key items, uh, and then talk about religious discrimination and hostile work environment claims. Shannon will address reasonable accommodation issues, dress codes, and employer versus employee rights. And then Jean will cover health care and the contraceptive mandate under the Affordable Care Act, as well as some other interesting issues related to that topic. To get started, let's look at some of the statistics which come into play when we're talking about this issue of religion in the workplace. Um, according to a Gallup poll conducted in 2011, more than 9 in 10 Americans still say yes when they ask the basic question, do you believe in God? That's 92% of Americans who state that they believe in God. Um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission received in 2012 3,811 claims alleging discrimination based on religion. Um, that is double the number of discrimination claims based on religion that the EEOC received in 2000. In 2000, there were only 1,939 claims. Um, the high point, statistically speaking, was in 2011 when the number of claims was over 4,000. In 2012, the EEOC reports that it received nearly $10 million or was able to negotiate nearly $10 million in settlements related to charges uh, based on religious discrimination claims. Now, I want to point out that the figures I'm giving you do not include include claims that were filed at state agencies or local agencies, um, which undoubtedly, you know, would make these numbers higher. Um, many of you uh, belong to SHRM and may have seen the cover story on HR Magazine, which is SHRM's um, mo monthly publication. Um, it's entitled Matters of Faith. And uh, so our, our, our topic is certainly a timely one. The EEOC is pursuing these claims um, essentially all over the country, so we're seeing more and more litigation. Um, the Matters of Faith article does mention a 2012 Gallup poll that found that 77% of Americans self-identify as Christian, 5% identify as a non-Christian religion, such as Judaism or Islam, and 18% of um, uh, individuals say they have no religious affiliation. So what laws apply in this area and do you need to be aware of when you're confronting a claim of religious discrimination or a request for a reasonable accommodation? The primary law that we'll be talking about and that you'll be dealing with is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. All of you are undoubtedly familiar with the statute, which is a federal law which prohibits employers from discriminating discriminating against employees based on a, a number of protected classes, including religion. Religion is defined in Title VII as all aspects of religious observance and practice, as well as belief. Um, 
course, you know, what does somebody believe and what is the sincerity of that of the belief is often a difficult question to answer. Um, the courts do look at this issue of the sincerity of the employee's belief, and oftentimes that hinges on the employee's testimony um, as well as the practice of their religion. And uh, that is a potential defense to employers in these claims if it is able to establish that the employee's belief is not truly sincere and uh, that the employee does not practice the religion they claim to. Uh, statute would also protect individuals who claim discrimination because they do not um, hold a religious belief or a particular religious belief. For example, um, there's a recent case the EEOC brought um, on behalf of an, a female employee who worked in a company where the owner of the company um, was a member of a religion that did not believe that women should be in the workplace and that women should be at home raising their children. And the employee claimed that because of the owner's religious beliefs that she was being denied certain opportunities at work. I've also seen cases, for example, where a company owned by a group of Orthodox um, uh, folks of an Orthodox Jewish faith, um, the claims that they were discriminating in, against an employee who did not hold the same faith as the owners of the company. These claims of religious discrimination will be analyzed under the McDonnell Douglas Corp uh, burden shifting analysis, which again, um, I think you're probably all familiar with. Um, the statute, Title VII, has specific exceptions and exemptions for religious entities. So there's a number of exceptions in the statute. One is for religious organizations, um, which are it's set forth on the slide there, but it's a religious corporation, association, educational institution, or society. Those organizations are exempt with respect to the employment of individuals of a particular religion if they are going to be performing work connected with the activities of that religious organization. The statute also has a specific exception for educational institutions, um, which is schools, um, colleges, universities, other institutes of learning. Um, those those uh, entities do not have to comply with the unlawful employment practices section of Title VII um, if they're able to establish that they need to employ employees of a particular religion and if that institution is unsupported, controlled, or managed by a particular religion, or if the curriculum is directed towards the propagation of a particular religion. So an example might be a Catholic seminary that is hiring uh, teachers to teach theology, and they say we need to employ people of the Catholic faith. Just a quick mention of a new Senate bill, uh, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, Act, which would add sexual orientation and gender identity to the list of characteristics protected against employment discrimination. I'm sure many of you have heard about this. The Senate passed the bill on November 4th, 2013, and it may or may not be headed to the House for a vote. There's a specific exemption for religious groups in this, in this law, um, which has created quite a lot of controversy. There are those who feel that the exception is too broad, and there are many who feel that it is too narrow. Um, but there is an exemption in there, and there is a specific section in the proposed bill that a religious institution uh, would not be subject to retaliation by the government if they refused to employ people who would otherwise be covered and protected by statute. Um, another statute that comes into play is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993. Um, Jean and her section on health care will primarily be addressing this law. The uh, law still applies to the federal government. Uh, some states have passed similar legislation. There is a Supreme Court case that says it is unconstitutional with respect to its application to states, but again, it still applies um, with you know the federal government. Um, and there are fairly complicated constitutional issues, which I won't get into, um, but again, Gene will talk about its relevancy with the Affordable Care Act. And then uh, finally, we have the U.S. Constitution, of course, the First Amendment, that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Um, that's obviously a key element in a lot of these cases. What exactly is a religion or a religious belief or practice? Uh, the screen gives you some examples. Um, there are court cases involving all of these matters. Um, you can see it covers a wide range of topics. 
a couple that I want to mention, the dreadlocks cases. There are a number of dreadlocks cases where someone might claim that the dreadlocks are related to their religious uh, faith. Um, one of the cases that I looked at, um, the court determined that the wearing of the dreadlocks by the employee was really a matter of personal preference and really was not a requirement of this individual's religion, and therefore it wasn't protected when he made a religious discrimination claim. However, the EEOC very recently just brought a suit in Alabama claiming that an employer's policy which forbid dreadlocks was racially discriminatory. The applicant came in wearing dreadlocks, and the employer told her if she wanted to get a job, she would have to cuff her dreadlocks. The employee refused, and now the EEOC is challenging that, saying that it's uh, racially discriminatory. Also, the Ku Klux Klan have been claims that that's a, a religious-based uh, belief system. Uh, the courts have typically held that's more of a political belief rather than a religious belief. Uh, sincerity is something we've talked about, I've mentioned briefly, but that's an area where there can be uh, legitimate doubts about an employee's claim. There's no standard test or method for establishing the sincerity of an employee's beliefs. But for example, an employee who claims that they honor the Sabbath, but you find out that they worked on Saturdays in a prior job, might be good evidence for you to say that that employee is not sincere about the belief. Of course, employees can change their beliefs over time, and you would have to um, to deal with that. Um, it seems logical that employers can make requests for certain kinds of information in order to establish the sincerity of an employee's belief. Perhaps you can interview the employee. Perhaps you can get a letter from the employee's religious leader or church. Uh, might be similar to an ADA issue where you request medical information in order to establish that an employee does indeed have a disability that you have to consider accommodating. Okay, now we're going to turn to some um, cases and examples of religious discrimination and hostile work environment. Under the hostile work environment framework, which again you are probably familiar with, the plaintiff must demonstrate that she belongs to a protected group, that she was subjected to unwelcome harassment. In this case, that the harassment was based on a protected characteristic, their religion. Um, that the harassment affected a term, condition, or privilege of employment, and importantly, that the employer knew or should have known of the harassment and failed to take appropriate remedial action. Of course, the discrimination has to be sufficiently severe and pervasive. Um, it must be both objectively and subjectively offensive so that a reasonable person would find it to be hostile or abusive. I will say the test for whether it's objectively or subjectively offensive will vary from court to court, from circuit to circuit, and from state court to federal courts. So there is some variation on that theme. Importantly, the courts will look at the frequency of the discriminatory conduct, the severity of the conduct, whether there are physical threats or humiliation involved, and whether it unreasonably interferes with the employee's ability to perform their job. I'm going to quickly cover three cases just to give you some examples of um, this area and the kinds of issues that come up. Griffin versus City of Portland is a recent 2013 case from a district court in Oregon in Ninth Circuit, which would be covered by the Ninth Circuit. This was a claim of hostile work environment. The plaintiff was a clerical employee who was employed by the city and worked in a very small office with four other individuals. The plaintiff made it clear that she was a devout Christian and that religion was the most important thing in her life. The team leader who worked in the same office with her verbally assaulted her on a number of occasions concerning her religious beliefs, referred to her as a wacko, uh, told her that God was merely a figment of her imagination, um, told her at one point that the team leader said she was sick of the employee's Christian attitude, she was tired of all the Christian things and items which the employee had on her desk. Um, the uh, employee uh, obviously was upset about that. A key issue in this case, too, was profanity. There was a lot of profanity used in the workplace, and the employee made it clear to her coworkers that she was offended by the profanity, and that violated her religious beliefs. Um, when, the, when the harassment, which she viewed as harassment, continued, she filed a complaint with the Human Resources Department, and the matter was investigated by the uh, city of Portland. Uh, but not to the employee's satisfaction. Um, the employee ended up filing a hostile work environment claim 
under Type 7, um, and the EEOC brought this case on her uh, behalf. The employer filed a motion for summary judgment, and the court, interestingly enough, said that they had found no Ninth Circuit case that dealt with standards for a hostile work environment in a religious discrimination context. So the court looked at sex discrimination cases and race discrimination cases and analogized those cases in the religious context. The key question for the court was, did the conduct occur because of the employee's protected status? And the court determined that there was sufficient evidence that um, this employee might be able to prove in a jury trial that some conduct occurred because of her religion. So, for example, with profanity, the court said if she can show that the profanity was uttered because of hostility to her religion, that would be important. Some of the profanity might have just been used casually in an isolated manner and out of habit by some of the employees, but if she could establish that it occurred because of her religious beliefs, it would be relevant to her claim of a hostile work environment. There were also some issues with the city's investigation because although they did interview some people um, and some of the co-workers and the team leader, it wasn't clear whether they had really investigated the religious intolerance claims, uh, which is uh, an important point when you're doing these investigations. You have to be able to deal with the issue head on. If the claim is religious discrimination or that issue is lurking in the background, make sure you deal with it during your investigation. The next case I want to mention is EEOC versus Sunbelt Rentals. This is a case from 2008 in the Fourth Circuit and involved a claim of discrimination by an employee who was a Muslim who claimed that he was subjected to consistent and persistent um, demeaning and degrading comments by his colleagues and by his supervisors. The employee was hired in October 2001 a month after September 2001. Um, there was a lot of name calling in the workplace. He alleged people called him Taliban, towel head, terrorist. Uh, there was harassment in the form of hiding his time card and making fun of him and saying that all Muslims were out to uh, be violent and destroy Americans. Um, the plaintiff complained to his employer, and when he complained, the manager did do an investigation but told the employee that if he maintained a positive at attitude at work, his problems would roll off of his shoulders. Um, maybe not the best way to have dealt with this. Um, interestingly enough, the employer in this case had taken steps to accommodate the employee's religion. They had allowed him to use a small room for prayer sessions and also allowed him to attend a weekly prayer session, which occurred during the normal work day. Um, the employee was uh, still unhappy with the situation, even after it was investigated, the EEOC filed a lawsuit on his behalf, and the court held that the employee had pled sufficient facts to satisfy the high bar and a severe and pervasive requirement. The court noted that many of the comments made to this employee were unrelenting and persistent. So again, you always want to look and see if the comments are isolated remarks that have only occurred once every six months. But or as opposed to occurring on a regular basis, um, the court will, that's a key factor. Another interesting element in this case was that there were customers who said that they came in, they were also Muslim customers, and they testified to the harassment they suffered at the hands of the other coworkers when they came in to do business. So the court will look at the environment from the employee's perspective, but in terms of analyzing the whole work environment, looked at what these customers experienced when they came in to, to do work. The last case I want to mention is the Hosanna Tabor Evangelical Lutheran Church and School Matter. This is 2012 Supreme, United States Supreme Court case. Um, I find it fascinating that this is the first time in 2012 that the U.S. Supreme Court agreed that there existed a ministerial exception to employment discrimination laws. Um, many, many of the circuits had already acknowledged the existence of this ministerial exception, but the Supreme Court agreed that there was such an exception um, and at least when it comes to employment discrimination claims. They left it open whether that exception would exist for other kinds of lawsuits, such as breach of contract. Um, but briefly in that case, you had two kinds of teachers working at the school, called teachers and lay teachers. Called teachers were uh, called to the vocation by God. They had to take certain theological coursework, and then they actually 
the title Minister of Religion commissioned. This teacher, who was a call teacher, taught religion and sometimes even led chapel services. She took some disability leave, and when she told the school she wanted to return to work, she was informed she had been replaced by a lay teacher. The employee threatened to file a disability discrimination claim, and the school terminated her employment. The EEOC filed a claim that the employee had been fired in retaliation for her threat to file the ADA claim, and it went back and forth in the courts, but the Supreme Court held that because of her position that she did meet the definition of a minister covered by the exception and that the lawsuit was barred. So those are just three examples of some of the really interesting issues that come up in this area. And now I'm going to turn it over to Shannon Farmer, who will start with reasonable accommodations. Thank you so much, Mary Teresa. Mary Teresa was talking about the primary law in this area is Title VII. And this operates in the religious accommodation area similar to the way that it does under the ADA. So an employer is required to accommodate the sincerely held religious belief of an employee if the belief conflicts with the job requirement and the employer can reasonably accommodate the employee without an undue hardship. There's a few things to note. First, sincerely held does not mean that it has to be widely held. It has to be sincere, as Mary Teresa talked about. Undue hardship in this context can be shown if a religious accommodation would cause more that is de minimis cost to the employer or imposition on workers. I think if you look at these cases, the bar for an employer to show an undue hardship under the religious accommodation standards is somewhat lower than it is under the disability accommodation standards. And I think it's a practical consideration by the courts because nearly everybody is going to bring some sort of a religion into the workplace and there's more likely to be a conflict between employee religions than in the disability context. Like the ADA, the accommodation that is granted by the employer need not be the one requested by the employee so long as the accommodation offered by the employee is reasonable and these cases tend to be very fact specific. So like the ADA, it is a best practice for the employers to be engaging in an interactive process with the employee and document each step of the interaction. So you may I be asking yourself, what kinds of reasonable accommodations are there? And similar to the ADA, there can be a very wide range. So for example, allowing an employee to change their schedule, allowing religious dress may be an accommodation we're going to talk specifically about dress code cases, extra breaks for prayer, other kinds of flexible schedules, unpaid leave, almost anything that will allow the conflict to be resolved. I'll talk about a couple of different kinds of examples of cases that come up. The first one I'm going to talk about is a case out of Alabama from 2011 that talks about scheduling. Scheduling can be a significant issue in the religious accommodation case. These cases generally involve either employee requests to not work on a Sabbath or work schedules that conflict with other types of religious obligations, including prayer during the day. In this case, there was a change in the the work schedule that caused a conflict with an employee's religious meetings. So the employee suggested that a more junior employee be allowed to fill in for him. The employer said, no, we won't let you do that, but you can use vacation time or you can have an employee of equivalent skill level fill in instead. In that case, what ultimately happened is the employee was chose the vacation option, tried to get people to fill in, but when couldn't, but then was also disciplined for excused absences and denied vacation time. The employee ultimately wound up resigning because they believed that they were going to be fired for this use of what became unexcused absences and filed suit. The court found that the requested accommodation to let somebody fill in was an undue burden, but also found that there were questions about the reasonableness of the employer's offered accommodation. And in this case, you can see the court struggling with the accommodation proposed by the employee and whether it was really reasonable. And it was a factor here because while the employer had said you can use vacation time, then when the employee was using vacation time or requesting to, it was being denied and the employee was facing discipline. So it's not only important that you say that there's going to be an accommodation that's granted, but that the employer actually follows through on it case I want to talk about in the context of scheduling is EEOC versus UPS. 
Yes, this is a recent case out of the District of New Jersey. A part-time employee requested a change to his schedule to attend a religious observance shortly after he was hired. The request was denied. He skipped work anyway and was terminated, and he was then placed on a company-wide do-not-rehire list. The EEOC filed suit on his behalf, and ultimately, this case resulted in a consent decree where the company agreed to pay money, conduct training, post notices, and have a court-issued injunction against further discrimination and retaliation. The key point about this case is this is a brand new new employee, and it was a part-time employee, but neither of those things net matter. There is no minimum length of service before a duty to accommodate attaches, and sometimes employers may feel this person was just hired, why they get a special schedule, especially if there are other employees who may feel that way as well, but there is no minimum length of service. On the issue of accommodations for prayer. Another EEOC case, you will notice the number, both in, in some of the examples that I've used and that Mary Teresa is, it's not a coincidence that many of these recent cases are ones that are being brought by the EEOC. This is a very active area for them. Um, and this case highlights not only the obligation to engage in the process in terms of the interaction, but also highlights the tension that can sometimes occur in these cases, as it does in the ADA, between the request for accommodation and the burden that it places on other employees. This employer was a production. They did a manufacturing um, case. They had a um, unionized facility with a fairly significant number of Muslim employees. A group of employees sought additional breaks for prayer time. The company rejected that, but offered to accommodate some employees by changing their shift. There's a number of back and forth, in fact, um, and, and what the employees were requesting came outside of the collective bargaining agreement, which had a process for written requests for religious accommodation, and it had an accommodation process built right in. There was also an unscheduled break request, but it was limited to restrooms. There were meetings that occurred with the company under the collective bargaining agreement. After that did not resolve the issue, the Muslim workers engaged in a work stoppage, which resulted in an agreement to move a meal break and shorten the evening shift by 15 minutes. Upset by the terms of that agreement, a large group of non-Muslim employees walked off the job, claiming the operations to shut down for a shift because they felt that they were being burdened by the accommodation that was being granted. So to avoid another shutdown, the company decided to not to implement the agreement that it had reached with the Muslim employees. In response, a group of Muslim employees engaged in a demonstration in the cafeteria and then refused to return to work, which resulted in approximately 80 Muslim employees being terminated. They then filed a charge with the EEOC, which resulted in the EEOC bringing suit against the company for religious discrimination. And in this case, the court held that although the EEOC presented an initial case of failure to accommodate, the company showed that the available accommodations, which were allowing unscheduled breaks or a mass meal break, would result in an undue hardship. They, the court found that the company demonstrated that the extra breaks for prayers within the parameters requested by the workers would have created a substantial financial burden because it would have slowed production and created... Uh, downtime that would all at the same time or could actually create safety concerns or quality concerns. It would impair the operational efficiency and there would have been additional expenses in addition to the more than de minimis burden on the other coworkers who were being forced to pick up the slack. It also showed that the mass meal break would cause safety issues, create an unacceptable burden on those other workers. As a result, the court found that the accommodations that were requested were an undue burden. A specific area of accommodation that warrants special note and has been in the news quite a bit is the area of dress codes. Dress codes cases often arise in the conflict between the dress codes and religious observance. There's generally two categories, safety concerns and concerns about public perception. The safety concerns often arise in examples 
for where a woman requests to wear skirts or loose clothing, those come up most frequently in law enforcement occupations like police or correctional officers or in manufacturing settings. Other kinds of cases can involve facial hair for men, particularly where they're in professions where you might have to wear respirators or other types of safety equipment. One of the challenges in these cases is there often are no alternative accommodations available. Note it can be an issue as well. Where there are safety concerns, I think you often see the courts deferring to those concerns if they appear to be based on legitimate safety concerns as opposed to prejudice or assumptions about what might occur. And this that comes up that I want to talk about is Webb versus City of Philadelphia. It's a few years old. It was a case here in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. There was a practicing Muslim who requested that she allowed to wear a kimar with her police uniform. And the department's objection in that case was not one of safety. Instead, the department said that it wouldn't allow anybody to wear religious symbols or clothing as part of their uniform. So any visible religious symbol, including a cross, because of the impact that it would have on the citizens of Philadelphia and didn't want to alienate people who might feel that they couldn't reach out to an officer and it would diminish the cohesiveness of the unit and they wanted religious neutrality for the police department. The court found that there would be an undue hardship to the city if it had to grant the accommodation because of the public's view of the police. One case that has been heavily in the news lately is EEOC versus Abercrombie and Fitch. And in fact, there are several cases involving Abercrombie and Fitch that have been litigated on this issue. But the most recent and the one that's gotten the most recent press um, is the one we want to talk about today, which is a recent Tenth Circuit case. There was a Muslim woman who wore a black headscarf or hajib to her interview. Before the interview, through a friend who worked at Abercrombie, she had inquired whether she would be permitted to wear the hajib and just told that it would be permitted, but a black headscarf would violate the no black policy that was part of the company's dress code, which they called their look policy. And when she was interviewed, she was not asked about her religion, but the interviewer, as it came out through discovery in this case, assumed that the employee was Muslim and figured that it was the, there was a religious reason why she wore the headscarf to interview. The interview. The interviewer described some of the dress requirements and informed the plaintiff that she'd have to wear clothing similar to that sold to Abercrombie. The interviewer did not tell plaintiff she'd not be able to wear the headscarf or anything like it. And the employee never directly informed the interviewer that she was a Muslim or she'd need to be exempted from the look policy for representatives for religious reasons. The viewer initially gave an evaluation recommending that the applicant be hired, but she wasn't sure whether the headscarf would be a problem, so she went to her supervisor. And the supervisor couldn't answer that question and consulted with the district manager. The district manager said she should not be hired because she wore a headscarf, and that was a clothing item that was inconsistent with the look policy. So the district manager instructed the interviewer to give her a score, a very low score, on the appearance section, and that ensured she'd not be recommended for hire. Now, when he was deposed in this case, the district manager testified that he had not been told that the plaintiff was a Muslim or that she wore the headscarf for religious reasons. The employee was ultimately not hired, and her friend told her it was because of the headscarf. After a charge was filed with the EEOC, it filed suit on the employee's behalf, or the applicant's behalf, I should say, for sued the company for religious discrimination. The court found that notice had been the notice to the company because it was the lower court said that you didn't the plaintiff didn't have to personally inform Abercrombie that she wore the hajib for religious reasons and would need to accommodation for it. The circuit on appeal, however, found that the EU 
the EEOC had not proved its case because the employee never told Abercrombie that she was a Muslim or was seeking an exemption from the appearance policy for religious reasons. And importantly, the court placed the burden on the employee to notify the company of the need for accommodation rather than placing the burden on the employer to assume that the employee had religious beliefs that need to be accommodated. Now, if this sounds similar to what you might do under the ADA, it is that you don't have to assume that disability exists. EOC has recently sought rehearing on Bonk, meaning from the full Tenth Circuit, and I would imagine that the EEOC will try to take this one to the Supreme Court if the issue comes against it, because it is very significant whether the employee has to affirmatively say it or when something appears obviously there obvious there's a burden on the employer to assume. I will point out that there have been other cases decided against Abercrombie and Fitch about their policy and for example in two thousand and twelve there was a California case where they were found liable for refusing to accommodate an employee and by telling her that she was told to take off the hijab under the same dress code policy, and they wound up settling that case with the EEOC, um, paying money to the employee who was terminated, as well as a second case in Texas. In another uh, case, there was, and this goes away from clothing, but another issue that often comes up is things like tattoos and piercings. In this Costco case, there's a member of the Church of Body Modification who had visible piercings on her face. The employer had a dress code that prohibited employees from wearing any facial jewelry except for earrings. She remo refused to remove the facial piercings or cover them with bandages while on the selling floor. And ultimately, this was litigated, and the First Circuit held that even though there were no complaints about her appearance, it was an undue hardship to require the company to grant an exemption because it would adversely affect the employer's public image given their determination that facial piercings detract from neat, clean, and professional images it seeks. So in this case, the court found being able to control its public image was an undue burden on the employer. It's hard to say in a case like this, however, whether the nature of the accommodation sought and the nature of the religious claim influenced the court and whether it would have found the same, for example, if it were a case of a Muslim employee wearing a hijab as opposed to piercings. The Ninth Circuit case, which is an older case, deals with this issue of the safety and the respirators. There was an employer policy which was based on safety requirements that prohibited facial hair that interfered with certain employees having to wear a respirator. The employee was a Sikh and he was prohibited from cutting or shaving any body hair as part of the religion. As an accommodation, the employer attempted to transfer him to another position with equivalent pay, could find one. He was then offered lower paying positions and he rejected all of those offers. The court found that the employer had offered reasonable accommodations and that a violation, an accommodation that would require the company to violate OSHA standards or changing his assignment to something that, to a position, for example, having to keep him in a position um, that would keep his rate of pay was an undue hardship or making other people do the work that would require a respirator that he would otherwise be doing and were undue hardships, and so they rejected his claim. Additional case talking about this issue of clothing that comes up in the safety context is a Third Circuit case from 2010. The Yoga Group operated federal and state prisons. There was a dress code that was instituted prohibiting any head coverings which were not part of the uniform. The employee requested an exception to continue to wear Mars. Now, these were this was a dress code that was imposed on employees who had already been there. The employer argued that any accommodation to the dress code would compromise the prison's interest in safety and security that it'd be more than a de minimis cost um, because the Kamar could be taken away from the employee and used as a choke or a restraint. They could also be used to smuggle contraband so that the employer would then have to have all of the them who are wearing the Kimar searched and checked at all of 
the entry, 16 entry and exit doors, so that would take time and resources. The court ultimately held that the religious beliefs were subordinate to the safety interests and for an accommodation was not necessary. The final topic I'm going to address today is the conflict that can sometimes occur between employer versus employee rights. Now, we've been in those previous slides talking about employee rights to exercise their religion. But sometimes cases arise where the claim is that the employer is trying to impose its beliefs on the employees. So several questions arise, and Jean Hempel is going to talk a little bit about these as well. Um, and one of the questions that is being litigated right now is, do employers have rights to religious beliefs? Can they enforce those beliefs on employees? What happens if the employer's religious beliefs conflict with the employee's professional obligations, particularly in the medical profession? And does it matter what type of employer? Not only for religious employers, what about nonprofits, and what about for profit employers? And Jean is going to be talking about those issues. For a number of years, there have been conscientious objector protections that have existed in certain areas, um, for example, that would allow doctors or nurses to refuse to perform certain procedures like abortions because of their own religious beliefs. What we're talking about here is the opposite. An employer attempting to restrict the services a doctor can provide because of the hospital hospital's religious belief. There was in 2013, just a few months ago, the ACLU filed a complaint with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment about a public hospital instructing doctors and empl other employees that they can't even discuss abortions with patients, even if a woman's life is at risk. And in this case, there was a cardiologist who was treating a female patient who had a family history of Marfan syndrome a serious condition and discussed and she pregnant and had discussion with her about how this could create complications associated with her pregnancy and among the options he discussed with her was an abortion. He reprimanded for hosp by hospital officials who told him that he was not permitted to recommend an abortion, nor is he permitted to even discuss the possibility of terminating a pregnancy with a patient regardless of the circumstances. And according to the ADLU's complaint, that prevents physicians from fulfilling their ethical obligations to patients and interferes with patients' rights to make informed decisions regarding their medical care. In that case, the hospital also maintains a set of guidelines issued by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops that restrict a range of reproductive health options that conflict with church teaching to not just abortion, but birth control, sterilization, fertility treatments, as well as certain end-of-life care possibilities and stem cell research. And the concern that many people have is particularly in areas where there may be no other hospitals hospitals in the area, there's a concern whether having policies like this in hospitals can prevent people from getting care. There have also been questions that have been raised about hospitals receiving federal funds, Medicare, Medicaid, and things like that when they're maintaining these types of policies. A recent case that is worthy of note um, involved a teacher who was working for a Catholic elementary school during 2011-2012, um, she was told that her teaching contract would not be renewed because she had gone through in vitro fertilization treatments and was told that that was an impropriety related to church teaching and violated the morals clause of her contract. Pastor at the school also told her she was a grave, immoral sinner, and that the news that she had gone through these treatments would cause a scandal. She sued, claiming employment discrimination in violation of Title VII, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, and the Americans with Disability Act. And the decision, the most recent one, really dealt just with the issue of discovery in this case because the diocese sought to avoid having to answer discovery, claiming that it was protected by the First Amendment and the religious exemptions. In this case, the court held 
held that the First Amendment precludes the government from taking certain actions with respect to religious institutions, not implemented by discovery requests from one private party to another. It also held that the statutory exemptions, which um, Mary Lisa talked about under Title VII and similarly under other statutes, are inapplicable because they only apply to religious discrimination and even then would not exempt a religious institution from complying with discovery requests. And another recent case related to an employer imposing its beliefs on employees, there was a the only female sales representative of a company, and this is a private for-profit company, she claims that she was terminated because of her boss, who was the owner of the company's religious conviction and traditional views on women. In that case, the owner of the company made comments that he believed that women should be home taking care of their husband and children. He would pay during business meetings and multiple employees during discovery in this case agreed that he showed preferential treatment towards those who shared his religious beliefs and attended his church. Um, he had, during a meeting, said that he was going to take the side of another employee over her because he was a church-going man, and he would not lie, whereas she would. In this case, the court rejected the employer's motion to throw out this case when she claimed both gender and religious discrimination. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jean Hemphill, who's going to talk about recent developments in the health care and religious conviction area. And, and so this uh, sort of this subject really is a continuation of the cases that Janet was just talking about, uh, and it really relates to an employer's right or the owner of a company's right to assert religious beliefs uh, on uh, the employees. Um, this issue has emerged in response to various federal and state health law coverage mandates in employer uh, group health plans. So um, what we're going to discuss today in the little time we have left are three specific emerging issues. The first is, can a privately owned for-profit corporation be a religious corporation with a First Amendment right uh, to the free exercise of religion and also to the protection of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or REFRA? This case uh, will the question and may be answered by the United States Supreme Court in the Hobby Lobby case, which we're going to talk about. Uh, it involves the uh, Obamacare requirement that uh, employee group health plans cover contraceptives, and of course, that employers are mandated to provide health care coverage that meets the ACA requirements. The issue is, can a law or regulation force a health care professional to provide services that conflict with his or her moral or religious convictions? And these cases involve uh, quite often pharmacies that are required to fill prescriptions for which they have uh, con religious convictions, uh, which would violate their religious convictions. Third is, can an employee be required to follow an employer's religious policy directives when it conflicts with his professional and ethical responsibilities to a patient, that's really the issue that Shannon just talked about in the Colorado case where the Catholic Hospital's um, um, directory uh, conflicted with the physician's professional responsibility to review all treatment alternatives with the patient. So let's go now to the uh, Affordable Care Act and contraceptive requirements. The Care Act uh, is designed to provide quality health care coverage, and that includes preventative health benefits that are offered by the plans that are in the exchange and for the employer group health plans uh, without a copay or a deductible. In other words, um, really uh, free coverage for these preventative health benefits. The point is to encourage um, individuals to go and get these preventative health services. In defining preventative health benefits for women, uh, the Institute on Medicine recommended uh, that preventative health benefits include certain exceptives and define those as the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, approved contraceptive methods, sedation procedures, patient education and counseling for all women 
women with reproductive capacity. Uh, and the FDA has approved 20 different uh, methods of contraception, ranging from oral contraceptives to surgical sterilization. Um, so the legal requirement that all employers provide and pay uh, for these procedures um, is morally offensive to uh, a, a large number of religious denominations, religious organizations, their members, and the companies uh, that those members own. Now, uh, some of the uh, in, in the religious convictions of the individuals that are involved in these cases range. Uh, the Catholic Church really has a concern about all of, of the um, contraceptives that are listed on the FDA list. With other denominations really limit their objections to the patient drugs and related education and counseling. So, uh, as I said, the ACA requires first dollar coverage. For these contraceptives, and um, the penalty is your plan doesn't offer them $100 a day per affected individual beginning January 1st, 2014. Um, these requirements uh, resulted in a huge uh, outcry from the religious denominations, and so first uh, the uh, Health and Human Services came up with a transitional. Uh, and that uh, continued really until January 1st of 14, and spent two years fashioning a rule uh, that was published in June of 2013 um, that we're going to go over. And uh, Mary Teresa gave statistics in the beginning of the slide production about the interest level on these issues, and I can tell you that uh, when the proposed rules came out for this um, uh, religious exemption, 400,000 comments were received by HHS. So this is clearly an issue of great interest to many individuals in this country. Uh, and there are now over 80 suits that have been filed uh, for injunctive relief uh, of the rule that starts January 1st uh, by a number of different organizations uh, to this rule. So the, the regulation that came out uh, from uh, HHS really attempted to balance the rights of the religious organizations uh, to exercise their religious beliefs with benefits that HHS feels very strongly should be available to all women uh, preventative health. And in the introduction to the final regulations, there is a lot of information about the public health interest of offering these benefits to all women as a preventative health benefit. And so I tried to structure regulations that uh, still made the benefits available to employees, but uh, uh, for the most part respected religious convictions of uh, the employers. Now, how do they do that? Uh, First, the rule has, has divides uh, the employers into two groups. There are religious employers that are absolutely exempt from the requirement to cover contraceptives, but it's a narrowly defined group and it's limited to churches, houses of worship, and really integrated auxiliaries as organizations, for example, the denominational uh, entities or, uh, um, you know, daycare that's uh, offered in the church building or what have you. So they have to be really related to the church, and they're exempt. Religious nonprofit organizations that hold themselves out as religious organizations are not exempt from the requirement. Their plans must offer the contraceptives benefits, but they are eligible for an accommodation upon self-certification. Is there a grandfathered plan Name a plan that has never changed any of the benefits since March of 2010, and you are grandfathered from many of the ACA requirements, you are exempt from this requirement. Others, uh, all other employer group health plans must offer these contraceptive benefits uh, without copays and deductibles. And the regulation is specific that it applies to nonprofit organizations, and so there is no exemption uh, in the regulations for for-profit organizations.
conditions. So uh, let's look at that accommodation requirement. Now, to have this accommodation, if you're a religious organization, so you could be a hospital or a university that is affiliated with a, a religious uh, organ denomination, you uh, are available for this accommodation. What you do is self-certify, and there is a form on the HHS website that you would fill out and apply that either to your insurer or to, with your self-funded plan, to your third-party administrator. And you, uh, that self-certification form, you have to certify that you're an organization that opposes providing coverage for some or all of the contraceptive services that are defined in the Preventative Health Service Benefit. The organization uh, is organized and operates as a nonprofit entity and that you hold yourself out as a religious organization. Now, that form does not have to be filed with HHS. It simply has to be maintained in your records for six years. Once you file that certification with your insurer or your third-party administrator, they must then administer and pay claims for contraceptive services. So your employees are uh, eligible for the services, but your organization does not have to pay for them or administer them. Um, there are regulations require them to sort of track that your premiums don't go towards the cost of those services. Now, TPA, the regulations provide that the third-party administrators will be paid for the contraceptives that they provide for these self-funded plans through an offset of their, um, their health insurance fee that they are required to pay. Um, Interestingly, the regulations consider the contraceptive benefits to be cost-neutral for insurers because they'll have fewer pregnancies to cover and other complications. So there is no uh, cost accommodation for insurers. So uh, many of these uh, cases, these regulations, be challenged if, in fact, there are these exemptions. Uh, first, for the accommodation is problematic for uh, many of the church plans that cover both the uh, religious organizations that are exempt all, right, from the uh, requirement, those that require the accommodation. Because our uh, concern is if you're a self-funded church plan, you still must go out and contract with the TPA for the provision of the services. And that would, you know, so maybe you don't have to pay for it, but you still have to contract for it. Uh, and as I said, then the, the, the case that's going to the Supreme Court is where you have a for-profit company um, and that wants the benefit of such an accommodation. There is an organization called the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, and they have been, it's a public in, a private interest, public interest uh, law group that works with law firms, and they have been involved in at least 80 of the cases that have been filed. A list uh, on this um, different cases, and I'm, I'm going to skip them, but they are there for you to to review in the interest of time, and go uh, now to the case that will be in the Supreme Court, which is the Hobby Lobby case and the Conestoga Wood case. Conestoga Wood case is a Third Circuit decision. The Third Circuit there found that uh, the, the, the for-profit employer, uh, th that uh, they do not have uh, the right for a free exercise clause. Uh, it had only been, uh, uh, was, a purely the exercise of religion is purely personal human right and did not extend to corporations. On the other hand, the Hobby Lobby case, uh, which is in the Tenth Circuit, in that case, the, the, uh, they found that the Freedom from Restoration Act uh, did uh, unduly burden the owner's Christian convictions, and therefore uh, it did, and that the corporation did have the free exercise. Clause. So we have a split in the decisions. There's also been some other cases, as you can see on slide 45. So um, we will now have this decided by the Supreme Court. Um, and very interesting to see whether Citizens United and the right to free speech is extended to for-profit for corporations with respect to the free exercise of religion. Interestingly uh, to note, a uh, free exercise clause has been granted for religious nonprofit organizations, so the distinction is going to have to be between for-profit and nonprofit corporations. 
Um, finally, uh, other religious conviction assertions, as we said at the beginning of this, um, there are cases where uh, individuals, employees, and owners, and, and the corporations have objected to health law mandates that, that just covering Plan B, which is the morning after pill. Uh, and in both of the cases on this page, the courts have struck down uh, the state laws, finding uh, that they um, uh, violated the religious convictions of the uh, individual employees and employers. Um, there are a growing a couple cases now that have sprung up recently, and Elaine Photography versus Wilcock on page uh, 48 is is one of them uh, that has been decided. And these are cases where individual employees are refusing to be involved with same-sex commitment ceremonies and marriages. In this case, it was a photographer, uh, and um, it's the commission, which was upheld by the New Mexico Court of Appeals, uh, found it to be sexual orientation discrimination. Uh, it's now on appeal, but there's also some bakery cases where people didn't want to bake cakes, etc. Um, we're now out of time, but uh, this is obviously cases we will see what the appellate courts and the Supreme Court say about these decisions. Mary Teresa talked about the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, which uh, prohibits employment discrimination on the base of actual or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity by employer or employing agencies. Um, there are exemptions for religious organizations. The inter religious organizations, as defined in that law, really follows more the definition of religious organizations in Title VII and not the definitions that you will find in the Affordable Care Act. So we also have all sorts of conflicting definitions of religious organizations in the federal laws, which makes it even more fun. Um, I uh, very much appreciate your attention. We have now gone over by a couple minutes, so I don't know that we'll have any time for questions, but as Mary Teresa said, if you send them in, we will be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you very much. I hope this was of interest.